Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, uh, for the great introduction. You set the stage pretty hard. The bar is pretty high for me. Uh, welcome to Nova Scotia. We are so proud uh, that you've chosen uh, our province uh, to begin your new life. Uh, when you hear Mohammed's challenges to get to Nova Scotia, it makes our problem seem mini it's pretty simple. Uh, Mohammed, thank you uh, for so much. And I want to acknowledge National uh, who provided Mohammed with the opportunity. Uh, we have said many times uh, it is the job opportunity that will keep people here. Four years ago, I had the good fortune of standing here for the very first time, and I'm back. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily that easy. <laughs> What I said, though, uh, I, I believe this with all of who I am, uh, we didn't govern to be reelected. We were reelected because we governed. Four years ago, when I stood before you, it was on the heels of the Ivory report coming out that laid in front of us some pretty stark challenges and harsh realities for our province. I said then, and I say it again, Change happens every day. The choice is ours to determine whether we shape that change or we let the change shape us. I've always believed that I would prefer to shape the change. And we embarked as a government to begin to shape the change of this province. We began by tearing down the boundaries with inside of our health system. We making sure that we have one health care system for the entire province of Nova Scotia. We're a population of under, under, under a million people, and you can go from one end of this province to the other in eight hours. It makes absolutely no sense to have the barriers that we had before us. Have there been challenges? Of course there have. Janet, it's great to have you with us. We know we'll look at the structure of our health authority and make sure it reflects the concerns that we've heard from one end of this province to the other, where communities feel their voice has been lost. We'll make sure their voice is heard inside one health authority. We will continue to reach out in, with our partners, doctors in Nova Scotia who are here. I know you've been working hard with Minister Delory. I appreciated the opportunity to sit down with you, myself, for the last two weeks. We will have solutions that we can address the issue of primary care by collaborating and working together to ensure that we have the health care system that Nova Scotians deserve and the one that each of us know that we can deliver inside of this province. Thank you for your continued commitment to Nova Scotians. We're about to embark on change in the education system. This is the second report in a row that told us there were challenges. Minister Churchill is here with us today. Minister Churchill, I want to say what a great job you did last night on the news, how articulating the position of our government and reflecting what Nova Scotians have told us, that there's too much bureaucracy, there are too many barriers between the minister and students, that there is no, it makes absolutely no sense that principals and vice principals would be in the administration. And if there was ever a time to prove when that failed us, it was when work to rule happened. And the only people that suffered during that period of time were our students. And let me tell you, we're going to embrace that report. We're going to continue to make sure that we make the changes in the education system. And each and every change we make, we focused on our children who sit behind the desk. And we know there's passion amongst teachers across this province who fully believe in what this government is doing. And I look forward to working with those teachers to ensure that we make the education system that will respond to the needs and the diversity of our population and the needs and diversity of our children. I said four years ago it would require all of us. We were just part of the change that would be required to move this province forward. Shortly after being on this stage four years ago, I reached out to the university presidents and had a meeting with them. And I asked them, I said, you are wonderful, you are amazing. Educational institutions, you're world class. But you now need to become a bigger part of the economy. And they stepped up. Four years ago, they changed the model. Driving innovation, working with the private sector. Look at what's happening with Volta. Look at what's happening with Ideas. Look at the issue with Cove. That's all been driven by innovation and partnership with the universities and the private sector. I want to say thank you to our university presidents who are here, some are here today. I also want to say to you that I know some of you are hurting. 
I know there are challenges associated with ensuring that we deliver the quality education that you have. I want to tell you that we'll, I will direct our Minister of Labor and Advanced Education, Labby Kasoulis, to work with you to find the right funding formula that reflects the reality of the day so that we can continue to build on those great institutions. I, for one, believe is it an asset to have 10 universities, not a liability, and we will work with you to make that investment. But let me tell you, it will require all of us to change. And the faculties of these universities will have to be part of that change to ensure that we provide a long-term stable environment for these institutions, not only to provide the education that our children and many children from around the world deserve, but they, they continue to drive economic development in communities across our province. <laughs> Patrick suggested it's not a time to take the easy road. I don't think any of my colleagues have suggested I've ever found an easy road for them to take. <laughs> but I'll tell you, it is not the time to take an easy road, and it is not time to change direction. Minister Casey will stand in the House of Assembly next month and table our third balanced budget. <laughs> That's been through a lot of hard work. That balanced budget wasn't an end. It is a means. It allowed us to provide the largest single tax cut in the history of this province, by 500,000 Nova Scotians will receive a reduction in taxes. It allowed us to increase the small business threshold from 350,000 to 500,000. And it allowed us to introduce a pre-primary program across this province, so no matter what the socioeconomic circumstances a four-year-old is born into in this province, they will get an equal start to be able to contribute to the economy of this province and grow to be all they can be. And that was only made possible by the fact that we've been able to have the government the capacity to invest in the things that matter to Nova Scotians. And we've been able to do that because of the hard work of Minister Casey and my colleagues who have stood the test when those who were willing to stand for the status quo they stood with us saying the status quo was no longer acceptable for Nova Scotians and we're now beginning to see the results of your great effort. <laughs> Mohammed, I want to thank you for being such a shining example of what can happen when we open up our hearts and minds to newcomers. You may not know this, but this province was built on immigration. We're all newcomers. Some of us just came here 200 years ago. We're on Mi'kmaq territory. The only people that can lay claim to this province are the Mi'kmaq. The rest of us are all immigrants. And the fact that you've continued to remind us the importance of that. It is absolutely critical that we as a province continue to open up our hearts and minds to new people. Over the last two years, we've welcomed more than 10,000 new Nova Scotians, the largest number since the end of the Second World War. Minister Diab, you've done a tremendous job. You're passionate about your file, and you believe and you live what it means to be a Nova Scotian, a new Nova Scotian, and what it means and what can happen to the economy of our province. You are a shining example for those who choose Nova Scotia as home, and I want to thank you for continuing to make your commitment to public service. We should not lose sight of the fact that over the last two years, though, we've been able to retain more of our own sons and daughters and more young people in our province. Four years ago, with declining population and youth out migration. For the last two consecutive years, we've seen youth in migration. We've retained more young people than we've lost. <laughs> don't, don't lose sight of those trends. Those trends will be the most critical things that we do as a government. Patrick mentioned in his opening, we need more people. Yes, we need new immigrants, and yes, we need to create an environment where our sons and daughters see their future for themselves here. Where sons and daughters of fellow Canadians and sons and daughters of people of the world see their place here in our province. And they've been able to identify and hope to see a future in this province because four years ago we made a decision as a collective. As a collective, we made a decision that we were going to collaborate and cooperate to provide those opportunities. We created public policy that provided a pathway for new immigrants and retain more young people, but it was you, the private sector, that's given them the opportunity to find employment and create jobs. We talked about Mohammed National. We've seen it throughout a number of sectors, whether it's through graduate opportunities, 
where you've reached out and hired a new grad, provided them their first chance of an opportunity here in our province. That's what's making the difference. What's making the difference is finally we're at a point where our public institutions, our government, and our private sector recognize we all need to be pushing in the same direction. We need to be working together to drive, because we, as Patrick said, we all want the same thing, a diverse, healthy, prosperous Nova Scotia. It isn't one of our jobs or the other. It is our collective responsibility to work together, to collaborate, to provide those opportunities. It's why I've been so proud. I just returned from Asia, and some of you may know my voice is hoarse because of that, not because I was out. <laughs> but let me tell you how exciting it is for me as your premier to be able to go to a, to, to a new country and talk about how this province wants to welcome new citizens. It isn't just a situation that four years ago we wanted to go into Asia because we wanted to export our product which, by the way, has been booming. We've gone from $100 million in exports in 2011 to over $600 million into the Asia marketplace. That is an impressive growth, no matter how you look at it. But it's, that's not just what we were looking for in Asia. We were looking for an opportunity to open up our province to a large group of people. My purpose of this recent trip was about a direct airline, direct access into China. It is the next phase in my view of our relationship. It's the vision we had when we started this journey. Yes, the first part was to get our products in. The second part was, though, to make sure that people understood this province was open, welcoming, and it was a place of opportunity. When I landed there a week ago, we started about a direct flight coming in, and the reception that we received, the airport authority was with me at that time. The reception that we received was phenomenal. It's not a question, in my view, if we'll get that direct flight. It's just how quickly we're going to get it. And it will make a tremendous difference in this province. I talked about our universities. It opens our universities up to sons and daughters of Chinese families and provides them an opportunity to grow the international student base. It is one part of the success of providing stability to those post-secondary education institutions. It also opens us up to a part of the world where the middle class is growing at an alarming rate, who want to go and visit the world. They're traveling. Why wouldn't we want to provide them that conduit into Atlantic Canada? And when I travel and represent you, I just don't say this is our airport. I say it's Atlantic Canada's international airport. It's in Halifax, it's in Nova Scotia. But we want those of you in Guangdong province, in Fujian, to understand that this part of the country is alive and well, full of tradition, and wants to open up our part of Canada to you. When we can achieve that, we will also achieve that inbound investment that will be required to continue to grow and provide opportunity. We are on the cusp, in my view, of continuing to move this province forward. Let me be clear, let me be clear. Our government is going to continue to govern the way we've governed. Within the best interest of every Nova Scotian in mind, when the decisions are tough, we're still going to make them. But we can't move this alone. And the success that we've had as a province, the federal budgetary offer says there's only one, two Canadian provinces that are on a strong fiscal sustainable health, and one of them is yours. One of them is Nova Scotia. When was the last time you heard anyone say that? But let me tell you, that's because four years ago, we made a choice. Four years ago, those that were in that room made a choice. University presidents made a choice four years ago. That not only were they going to continue to be the quality of education facilities they are, and by the way, happy birthday, Dalhousie, 200 years. They were going to look at how they can drive economic development, job creation. Businesses made a choice four years ago. They were going to look for avenues to hire, provide opportunities for our sons and daughters. Four years ago, we made a conscious decision that we had to change the way we were doing business. And by doing so, the world sees us differently. They see a more confident Nova Scotia. They see a more confident private sector. 
and they see high quality post-secondary educations that will provide their children a top quality education in a safe environment. That's what happens when communities come together. That's what happens when we as a province come together. I am committed to continuing to grow this province. I am committed to ensuring that our sons and daughters see a future for themselves here. I'm very happy to be joined by Colleen, who is my daughter, by the way, even though she does work, work at Boyne Clark. That was forgotten in the introduction. Uh, and her brother live in this province. I want to see that same thing for every other young person who decides they want to choose this as home. Together we can make this happen. We can't falter, we can't wave, we can't listen to all the noise. The results are being proven that we're on the right track. We're on the right track together to making this province all it can be, providing the same opportunities that I felt I had a few decades ago when I began my journey on what my future would look like. We are here. Let's not step back. I've said this before, and I'll end on this note. Political capital is like private capital. Private capital you spend when you look at an opportunity to grow, great. Political capital is meant to be spent too. And I'm prepared to spend all the political capital I have if it's in the best interest of you and every other Nova Scotian to move this province forward. I want to close by introducing one of the tables down back here. It's Ellen Farrell. Ellen, would your table stand up? This is why you should all be hopeful. This is why you all should be proud. This is a group of young students from St. Mary's University that went down to the United States to a venture capital investment competition in Boston. They took on all of the top schools, MIT, Dartmouth, Yale, the list goes on, and they finished second. But let me be clear, they actually only finished second by, I think it was, a, someone determined it was a qualification or something that they, they it's kind of like figure skating judging, I think. <laughs> But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I, I met this group in Boston when I was down uh, with the Christmas tree. I want to tell you how proud I am of you. I want to tell you how proud we all are of you. Uh, the commitment that you've continued to make uh, to, for, towards your education. How proud you represented us uh, as a province in the United States. And can I say to you, what an example of confidence you've shown us. And it should be for all of us in this room. There are Nova Scotians who've demonstrated their confidence when they've gone out and built global companies. But we all have to make sure we demonstrate the confidence that these young men and women did. They weren't afraid to go down to Boston and take on MIT. They weren't afraid to go take on Yale. They went down in the humble, confident way Nova Scotians go about doing their business. And you've demonstrated to us what's possible when you keep to the values of who we are as, a, as a Nova Scotians, but do so in a confident, humble way. Congratulations from all of us. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for coming out. Uh, and Tom Hayes wanted me, reminded me when I come in, you weren't coming here to see me, it was the free parking that got you here. Thank you all so much.